Right. Um, what we've done, we've been looking at a whole range of issues that, that arise during the development of a, a new sort of IT service. And the last really important part, which relates to the last section of the assignment, is how do we measure whether that service is actually successful and what success might mean. And there's some examples from previous years, which I've built in here, um, which will give you some ideas that you will then have to take and rethink in the context of the, your own service that you're developing based around sort of improving the use or improving services based on the use of location services on your smart devices. <coughs> so I'm going to go through a, a series of things and then we'll have some discussions um, during the kind of lectury seminar section. And then the other half of the session, the workshop session, I'm going to come around and talk to each of you individually about what your ideas are about that service, about the sort of application you can develop or you can um, kind of say is what you need based on all the things we've talked about so far, from what it should be, uh, then using the Zachman Enterprise Architecture top two layers to kind of identify some of the important uh, enterprise architecture issues around the, the project and then build in the success criteria. And I need to make, mention that in previous years many students have not really got to grips with this final section how to measure the success or otherwise of a service. It's really important, it's one of the main uh, criteria you'll see from the marking scheme that we need to have something that's really well developed about measuring success. And the first thing you need to think about is go back to the beginning of the design and think about who are the stakeholders in this service, in this project. Go back about four or five weeks to when we talked about stakeholders. And you learned about stakeholders and started doing some research on who and what are stakeholders. And then what you need to do, having identified the two or three really important people or gr groups of people who you can call the stakeholders and who are interested in the success of your project, <coughs> you need to think about what are their interests. What are they interested in, in terms of making sure this thing works. And you can use these same sets of criteria in that group project work you're doing with Clive. You think about who is your client. Yeah, there's somebody who's the, you know, the charity or the business who wants you to do something for them, but they aren't the only stakeholder. There are other people involved in exactly the same way you need to think about the stakeholders in the project you are sort of kind of specifying for this module. And then having th thought about what their interests are, how are you going to measure the performance or the uptake or the success of your application to show that their interests are being met and satisfied? So it's a step-by-step -step process. And you have to have measures which you can actually measure. You know, these are criteria <coughs> which actually lead you to a way of collecting some numbers of some sort or other that help you to define is it successful or not. And if you think about apps on smart devices, the very, very simple measure is how many times has it been downloaded? But is that a useful measure? Does it tell you very much about its success? I see shaking heads. Why not? What does, what's the problem with number of downloads of apps onto smart devices? Well, they might have just picked it up, plugged it up for 10 seconds and then put it down. And then forgot to delete it. Yeah. And we, know, we all know we've got lots of apps on our smart devices, our tablets and smartphones, which we downloaded because they looked interesting and we haven't quite got round to deleting it. 
and reviews. Yeah, you can look at the reviews. <coughs> but then again, what's the problem or what are some of the issues relating to the reviews that you see on these app stores? Some people, um, some people from the company usually write them off. Yeah. They, they cheat, sort of thing. There's pervasive cheating of reviews, whether it's about an app or about a hotel or about a restaurant. And remember also, the human nature which marketeers have known for 40 or 50 years, that if I am hacked off with something, a service, whether an app or whether it's a, a restaurant or the, the waitress or the waiter, we will ten, tell about 10 people that we're really unhappy. Those of us who get the service we expect probably can't be bothered to write a tweet or a Facebook entry or a review. Those of us who are really spectacularly happy might possibly, so the marketing research tells us, tell maybe three people. And this is one of the big challenges that we see in big data analytics, of content, content analytics, of things like social networks, is that the people who actually engage in these sort of reporting mechanisms are very, very self-selected and Typically, many, many more people will engage when they're unhappy than when they are happy. So we have a problem about using these sort of comments. We have to take them as they are. And one of the interesting things in relation to this was um, about two years ago, Santander, the big Spanish bank that bought up one of the building sites in the UK and now a big bank here in the UK, they do a lot of social uh, networks analytics about from, uh, from tweets and postings from their customers. But very, very wisely, they use adverse comments as, a, as an early warning to themselves that they've got something wrong in their processes, something wrong with the way their systems are working. And I'll use systems in its very broad terms, um, covering both technology and communicate, uh, people and documents and workflows and so on. So at Santander do not use them to say, ah, we've got something really badly wrong, we'll go and shoot a few of our uh, counter staff. No, it's, we will go and do an investigation to find out what's going wrong so we can help to improve things. So we have to be a bit careful about measuring things like, or using things like, uh, these are postings and the feedback, but they're still always valuable, except for those which, as you said, were, were the um, uh, cheating ones where someone, the owner of the app or the owner of the ho hotel or restaurant gets someone to write a dozen really great five-star reviews. Or on the other side, a competitor will hire someone or themselves will write a whole series of zero-star adverse comments. So we have to be careful about some of those perceptual ones. What other factors might be interesting? Say the owner who's investing some money in developing the, uh, the app or the service. What might they be interested in given that they've put money into it? Money out of it. Pardon? Money out of it. Money out of it, yeah, if it's going to give a monetary return or sort of some sales, yeah, they'll look for the sales that come through it and also think about the profitability, perhaps. To destroy the opponents. Sorry? To destroy the, the opponents, like the competitors. Well, it's you know, looking at your relative competitive strengths again and success against your competitors is another good one, yep. You might find it interesting to try and track down the numbers that would support that, but yeah, it's a good one. What other things might the owner, the funder, the commissioner of the project be interested in? Think about your projects you're doing on Clive's um, module. What other things are the, is the owner going to be interested in? I suppose how we can improve it. How we can improve it. Right. What are project management and program management of the task? Do you think, what, what other things are they going to be interested in? Very easy to manage and collect data. Now you've put together, you will be, if you haven't already put together a program 
of tasks and activities for your projects yet, you're going to need your, your clients in Team Project are going to want to know when is it going to be delivered. They're going to want to know when is it first delivered, when is it going to be tested, when is it going to actually go into service. So did it meet the program? Did it meet all the target the milestones on the day that the milestone should? It should have happened. Where ninety percent of them have gone wrong is in the past is where is where they haven't been <coughs> done dummy run. Not done, done not done dummy runs, they've not so done why, proper. Why not why don't um, just do them? Just do a dummy run on the actual <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because that is a critical area. Have we done a proper test run with proper amounts of test data? One of the problems is often, and if you look at the SAP as a, a product that people implement in business, they develop, have a three or four tier process. They start in the, test, the develop, development environment, try and get it as good as possible there with small amounts of sample data move it into a test environment, uh, maybe a pre-prod environment, and then into production. There's sort of staged uh, releases through that, through the change management process. One of the really big problems is then being able to do the last user acceptance test level in the UAT, user acceptance test environment, before you finally release it, is having adequate amount of data and adequate amount of repre representative size of processing and data storage and so on. Because if you do your user acceptance testing, your load testing, in a baby environment with one server and a few people using it and a small sample of representative data, things will probably work with reasonably good performance. But there is then an interesting difference, and I saw this with a project that I was working on, where we dumped all the way through that and it worked a treat. And then we went into production, and then a week, month later, we fired up the first big uh, end of month um, full system uh, generation, which dumped about 50 million records into what had been, until then, an empty table. And then on Monday, when we went in, the system was working okay, and suddenly it just stopped working absolutely for 30 minutes. Then it came back to life. And then it stopped again for 30 minutes. Then it came back to life for a few minutes, and then so on. And eventually what happened was, it took about a week to discover really what had happened. During the development of that particular implementation, for a variety of reasons, the search criteria in one particular transaction had been changed from one column, which was a standard uh, column to search on, to another column. And it turned out that someone had forgotten to build an index on that new column. So when the owner of the transaction did press the button to do an inquiry, rather than the indexes in the database taking the system directly to the right row, the poor little computer, which was a very powerful one, had to go all the way from top to bottom of 50 million records. Oh dear. You see, when they were doing the testing, they'd probably got a thousand records in that table. Now a thousand records, I mean, however big the table is, is going to fit into your four gigabytes of RAM that that processor had associated with it. When you've got 50 million records, it's kind of much less likely. So it's then having to read the whole table, row by row, and try and find the answer. I don't suppose anybody else has ever done that since then. That has been logged in the SAP implementation records, I would suspect, from as long ago as 2000 when we found this. Please remember, if you modify this transaction, check you've got an index on it. So, a variety of measures. And what your real challenge in the assignment, in this section on measuring the success of your uh, service, is to think through here. Who are the uh, critical stakeholders? Because it could be the owner, it'll be often going to be the users, you know, the number of downloads or the number of active users. <coughs> 
how long they stay using it for. And if you think about some of the stuff that's coming out of the current research into the use of wearable smart devices and wearable devices, where it's things like Fitbits and all of those little things that measure your activity levels and so on, one of the things that's happening is large numbers get the gadget, use it for a while, maybe bitch about getting it connected to their smart device or not, uh, maybe use it, maybe use some of the gamification so they are competing with their friends and their colleagues for a while, and then the usage kind of slowly drops off. And by the end of three, four months, it's no longer being used. So we need to then start thinking about why are people not using it? Why aren't they engaging in continually keeping up with their fitness um, exercises or whatever it is they're doing with all this data that's being captured? How can we capture all of that? How can we prove to our stakeholders that it's actually working? Now, here's, based back on last year's and the year before, where the challenge last year, and you'll see from the top, t the top item in the course resources, uh, is the two e-books published over the last couple of years from this module. And what they were looking for were things that they could do to develop apps on smart devices which would be suitable for student use. So it's going to give you some ideas about how we looked at it then and you can have a look at those, e those two ebooks as course resources. Those are critical reference material to see how to go about doing things. <coughs> and people are trying to look at, okay, so these apps would be provided by our IT services central department here mainly aimed at students as users, whether it's the uh, Blackboard app or whether it's the uh, University of Derby student app or whatever. And then we're looking at things like better ways of accessing the library, doing things with library services, the bus timetables that you see on the TV screen in the atrium. Uh, you looked at ac um, academic staff might be feeding data in to help you guys know when you're lectures and your workshops were happening, when exams were happening, when your uh, due dates were. We were. They were looking at getting ways of putting some of this stuff through into your diary. Um, people downstairs, in, uh, across the way in student services, a student union, accommodation, <coughs> people um, like the host, cloud hosting organizations who host these apps and things like that. So, a whole range of stakeholders were involved in developing and supporting and using these apps which were aimed at students. So the question then is, okay, well, if we have a look at those, what are their interests? So in a sense, if you look at what you are doing for the client's module, you could say the IT services are the owners and are equivalent to your clients that you're working with to develop these sort of applications uh, as a part of your project. And typically, the sort of, those, that's a list of the sort of things that they're kind of interested in. How, how much of the time is it available? Is it really truly available 24-7, 365? Or is it only 90% availability for some reason, or 95% or whatever. How reliable is it? Does it always work or is it broken and keeps needing updates? Think about the Standish Group reports about project success and failure. Is it on time? Was it to the budget? Does it deliver all of the specified functionality? Is it therefore a successful project or is it going to be a challenge project, i.e. it doesn't meet those properly, or is it a failure where it doesn't get implemented? That's kind of a big waste of money. Yeah, we talked about uptake in number of downloads or installations. We've also talked about the more valuable one, which is the amount of use that we're getting from it. 
feedback that has been mentioned, um, the numbers of feedbacks, positive, negative, indifferent, uh, requests for changes and improvements, uh, any aspects around the service level agreement. So if you don't know what a service level agreement is, go research it and find out. Get some typical examples of SLAs. Because as you move into next year in your job, your placement job, you will find that if you're working for uh, IT support teams, there will be SLAs about all sorts of things, like how quickly, if you're on the uh, first line response in the help desk, how quickly do you pick up the call? Uh, how quickly do you solve the problem? How many of those problems do you escalate to the second tier or third tier levels? And how quickly do those two levels also solve the problem? So the provider of the service at the technical level. Students or users, depending on which project you're looking at. <coughs> and you can look here very much at some of the stuff you're learning with Dennis in IT product design. So how often do I use it? How often does the user use it? How often are they supposed to use it? How often were they intended to use it? So you can link to the TAM and UTAUT that we talked about last week in terms of you know, intention to use and actual use. Where, why, what's my intention? So, you know, you're really picking it all up here. Who knows what the DDA standards are or requirements? These are criteria about the Disability Act, uh, about um, designing websites, designing apps, so that people who are maybe deaf or maybe um, visually impaired or have other disabilities, can they use the app as well? There are legal requirements about how we make our apps available so everybody can actually use them. And it's absolutely no defense to say, well, this is designed for maybe for mountaineering uh, activities. To say, well, you know, if you are uh, a wheelchair user and you are very, have very bad sight, you aren't going to be interested in my shop, therefore I don't need to worry. Wrong answer, the law doesn't like that approach. You are still required to make it available to them. And of course, if it's a proper web design, or screen-based web design, or smart device, then there's a W3C criteria by designing your website with hover over tips and voice over and so on, that you need to be thinking about. And you know, we have so many websites where the human computer interaction criteria are Oh, approach is really, really bad. It's, they're just unusable. And it's kind of completely indefensible to not be able to design good websites. The library in this instance was trying to make it easy for you guys to use it, trying to improve the ability of the library staff to meet your needs as users. And so, as one of the contributors to the content of your uh, app or your service, how are you affecting your supplier of information? Is it easy or is it automated or is it really complicated and difficult? And when we looked at bus companies to have a really nice up-to-date bus timetable available on your, on your um, U University of Derby app, these were some of the things that we needed to think about. And that included then data interfaces where they've got their timetables up-to-date and for some of the buses here in Derby, <coughs> you've got real live information as that it's just about to get to you or sorry it's delayed by five minutes. You, if you go down to the bus stop at the bottom you'll see that little display panel that tells you when the next bus is coming along, which number bus is coming and so on. So you then start thinking about okay data interfaces, what am I trying to add together with location services to actually come up with something useful for this app? How do we get that data? How frequently can we get that data? Uh, and things around those data formats, data validity, validation, 
do you need to actually validate the data that's coming from your supplier because it might not be accurate? And remember, 80% of all the data we have in big data out there on the internet and elsewhere is of uncertain veracity. We don't know which data is correct, we don't know which data is incorrect, neither do we know how incorrect it is. So if the bus is saying, I'm going to be three minutes late, can I really rely on that? Or is it going to change to four minutes late in a couple of minutes? How many of you use the trains and get on the state, go to the station and you watch that display on the platform? And it says on time. And then a little bit later, a minute late. Then a little bit later, oh dear, he's gone to three minutes late. And four minutes late. And then it kind of, yeah, it's going to arrive then. Veracity of data. Or two, two minutes become four minutes. Yeah, easily two minutes becomes four minutes and then suddenly it's ten minutes late because it's got stuck at one of the uh, uh, signals. So you might need to think about, and with location services, one of the things that's really important, and that was discovered by a company out near Ilkeston, where our, some of our students get their placement year. They provide the equipment and software and ana analytics services on a cloud-based solution for fleet operators of vehicles, lorries and buses, typically. And they capture the data at regular intervals and then put it into their analysis and feed it to the fleet management um, responsible staff. One of the first things they discovered was that the GPS tracking is not always accurate. <coughs> and so they had to put a filter, a, a sort of consistency filter, to pick up those times when the GPS latitude longitude suddenly went a bit batty. And suddenly, instead of being cruising at the legal 56 miles an hour along somewhere, they suddenly went at the speed of light to somewhere miles away and then came back onto the road again. Just because location services and GPS are not 100% accurate. So they had to build filters into their IT services to make sure that they didn't actually get their drivers or the drivers of their lorries into trouble. I was talking to one of you, a guy who is up in um, an organisa organisation up in Yorkshire, and they use this precise fleet management service. And uh, the student went out with one of the drivers to test or to check out how something was working. And the driver suddenly said, oh, it's reporting that I'm coasting, which I'm not allowed to do. But on this vehicle, with this particular contr engine control system, it does it automatically. I have no control over that. So he took that message back to the um, office and said, guys, we need to modify this app uh, or the service to delete references on these types of vehicles because the engine control system does this and the driver has no ability to change it um, and otherwise we're going to uh, punish them for doing what they can't affect. So all of this sort of stuff becomes really, really important. If you are going to host your software or your services out in the cloud, some of the types of questions you need to start thinking about. And people fall into problems with all of these areas at the moment. Whether it's load balancing and the fact that over the next two, three, four weeks, Turnitin worldwide, UK specifically, is going to get a huge bump blip in their workload, in their resources. But all of you are busy submitting stuff and you're possibly wanting to get it to check your um, document once every day um, as you lead up to the final submission just to make sure that your similarity levels are as low as possible uh, and anything else that you're interested in using that. If you're using standard cloud services, you probably are too small to actually be able to adjust the standard service level agreement. And I saw something only a couple of days ago that if you are a very, very large organization and one of the first few organizations to use that particular cloud service, you can probably 
negotiate some aspects of the SLA. But most people won't be able to because they're tr tiny, of no particular significance to the supplier of the cloud services, and you just take what is. And if you read the small print, you suddenly discover you've actually got no claim on them for when they are off air. Even if you're quite big, um, I saw some numbers yesterday that one hour loss of access to your, inf or your data, your systems, uh, is worth, for some organizations, half a million to a million dollars an hour, or even more. Yeah, so for how long was that? Two hours. They had to get it done really quick. That's why I was just sitting there watching yeah. it So a two hour outage was worth a couple of million quid to that company. And as we move into the cloud based services, if you think about small and even large organizations, Santander, I think it is, now use Office 365 in the web. What happens when? you lose access to that. Either the man in the yellow digger digs up your connection or there's a, den a distributed denial of service on AWS or wherever it might be, or the Microsoft Cloud, which happens occasionally. What do your staff do when Office 365 goes offline? You send them home. Because there's nought else they can do. You bring in paper and pens. Oh gracious, you can do paper and pens. Well, yes. <laughs> Good thought. But who knows about paper and pens any longer? Because you only got to add it back into the system, actually, often. But yeah, you're right. And then there's all the ISO 27K sort of standards of security and governance that need to be built into that. But we'll cover the governance issues in a year, in um, the, the third year, in Sustainable Information Corporate Governance. But if you want to find out about it, you can always go and have a look at the videos from last year and from this year that I post up at the, those sessions. Other, these are other sorts of criteria relating to different set of users who are maybe users but also providers of information. So we were looking at, in last year's scenario, that we had academics like me and so on who were both pouring data into some of the apps and maybe using them. And remember that bottom link back to the UTAUT criteria. Student services, these are people who are trying to uh, are providing quite a lot of data to you guys about all sorts of things, about how they can support you, um, the types of extra uh, teaching that can be done, or training courses, um, lots of other things. And again, we come back to things like, is the information up to date, or is it three years old and no one's bothered to update it? How many times do you go to a website and find that it's not actually been changed for two, three years? Yeah. A, it's not a very good uh, advert for the importance and value of that information, it also gives you an insight into how the people who use that part of or provide the content view the importance and value of that. If they haven't updated it, and you can look at it in terms of the sometimes of the copyright dates <coughs> to see when it was last updated. It might be that there's no change, or it might be, ah, oh, I can't be bothered. If it's a can't be bothered, is there any value to that information? Same set of questions that we were looking at some of the content on the University of Derby uh, student app, which related to student accommodation. Uh, and there were a lot of criticism about that. But same sort of questions. What's their role? What are their interests? Can we measure any of those things? And then the app provider, it could be you know, like you're doing for team project, you might be creating something, 
or it might be commissioned to the IT support services in the company, or it might be sent out to a specialist subcontractor or who can actually do the job for you efficiently. Uh, yeah, our standards, because one of the things we noticed with last year's and the year before Student uh, University Derby app, particularly, I think it was on both iOS and Android, they didn't actually meet any of the standards that were put, that are sort of set up for iOS apps or for um, the, the Android apps. It was kind of completely bizarre. It was not standards compliant in any way, shape or form. And that's a very, very important issue. Very issue. So as we look at some of the criteria, the measures you could use, in terms of success and failure overall, use the Standish Group materials. And I think though the Standish Group material reports are in uh, the interesting resources folder in the course resources for you. Their definition of success was on time to budget and delivering all of the signed for functionality. Now I expect to see citations to quite a lot of the Standish Group reports uh, for the owner type, type of uh, measures. Operations, and as in IT, computing, now, operations is a really important stakeholder, a really important area that we need to measure. And it's some of the simplest stuff to measure as well. And then go back to TAM and the UTAUT. You've got all those resources from last week. I expect you to use those and let many of the more recent ones in the last five years. There's a lot of stuff that's happened um, in terms of AUT, UTAUT 2 and 3 over the last few years. So I want you to use that because that's really important. <clears throat> and it's actually quite an easy section of the assignment to write about if you really think it through carefully. The Zachman Arch Enterprise Architecture again provides some really interesting questions that you can use to have a look at the whole of your service and think about how are we meeting those who, why, where, when, what, how questions and maybe how, how much as well. So those will also help you to ask the right questions against the interests of two or three of your critical stakeholders. Where might you find some of the data? Who might be able to contribute? Success and failure, the standard group type factors. Well, your project manager should have all of that lot. It should have access to the costing the uh, data, the timescale data, and through the risk register and the testing schedules, find out about, you know, has it met all the functionality questions. <coughs> you may want to use some of these. and we've, we've talked about some of the issues relating to the veracity of those sort of reviews, uh, the trustability, you might want to do some surveys. You might suggest that a survey could be quite useful in one way or another. Think about some of the statistics that come out of your operating system about the number of discrete, uh, distinct users, the frequency with which they uh, use things and connect. There's lots and lots of measures you can think about. And in terms of things like the intention to use, the actual usage, the, uh, and all of those other peripheral questions, well, you might use surveys, you might use questionnaires, you might somehow use crowdsourced data in one of many, many ways. So it's, again, gives you opportunity to think through which is the best way of getting the data that we need. As part of this, the questions are unchanging. But you need to have a really good bank of questions um, up your sleeve so that you can choose the best questions to get the right, some really good answers that help you 
to come up with good answers to, is it a, has it actually worked? What needs to be done to make it better? So I've given you lots and lots of questions here that you can then interpret into the context of what you're actually working on. So what I want you to do now is to think carefully about each of your projects that you're doing. And you can think about it in terms of your uh, team project work with, uh, with Clive and also in terms of the IT service you're using as the basis of your assignment here. And then in a few minutes time I'll start coming around to see each of you to talk about your little, uh, what you're going to write your article on and you, know, you can bounce ideas off me and I can you know, start looking at what you're doing. You can show me your drafts as you development over the next couple of weeks and then in three weeks time <coughs> you will submit your so-called final draft but on the evening of the 29th of November and then I will put, a, put together a schedule for the following Friday where you'll come to my office and show me and I will look at your version or what you submitted and give you some really clear feedback that will help you to develop from where that is to when you have to submit it finally just after Christmas and the dates at the top of the assignment spec folks. Okay? <laughs>